I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is brought to you by MX Publishing, with the largest catalog of new Sherlock Holmes books in the world. New novels, biographies, graphic novels, and short story collections about Sherlock Holmes. Find them at mxpublishing.com. And support for this episode is by the Wessex Press, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com. I hear of Sherlock everywhere. Episode 208, The Collector's Corner, with Charles Prepolek. I hear of Sherlock everywhere, since you became astronomer. In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. <laughs> the game's afoot as we discuss goings-on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger shooter regulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Bert Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Hello and welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. And Bert, what are you collecting these days? I'm collecting dust, actually. And it's amazing what sort of a magnet I can be as those little particles distribute themselves over my stationarily held face and nose and eyeglasses. Why, pretty soon I'll be the sort of the envy of the House of Usher fans in my neighborhood. Well, that's love. I don't see how you could possibly collect dust the way you move about. That's crazy. Well, that's true. You got to keep moving. Got to keep moving. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, the issue about collecting dust isn't, you know, the fact that you need to be stationary. It's how you file it. That is really the tough part. <laughs> well, if you'd like to follow along on this episode, you can find it at ihose.co slash ihose 208, all lowercase. If you'd like to email us, we've gotten some Fascinating emails of recent uh, date. You can email us at comment at I hear of Sherlock.com. We are I hear of Sherlock on all of the social networks. And of course, the phone lines are still open. We hear from people from time to time, um, including inquiries that we didn't even anticipate. You can reach us at 774 221 read 774 221 7323. Or if you just want to stop this episode right now, hit pause. Open up the audio recording app on your phone, record a voice memo, and then attach that to an email and send it to us. That works, too. We are nothing if not accommodating when it comes to voice messages. Well, we should remind you that this is season 15. This is the first episode in our new season, first season of 2021, and we are doing something different for all of our patrons If you would like to support us at any level, from a dollar an episode to, excuse me, we're not even doing it per episode. That's what's different. A dollar a month to whatever amount you feel uh, per month, we are happy to have you. And it gets you a variety of level of thank you gifts. But every single person who is a patron at whatever level, I hear of Sherlock everywhere, will have access to a new community that we've put together on Discord. Uh, It's a link that we will send you in an email once you have uh, uh, indicated that you are a supporter of the show. And it's an online community where we can chat about various things. We can set up little rooms to kind of keep the conversations focused. Uh, It's something we're trying out for 2021, uh, season 15, and uh, we hope you'll try it out with us. So whatever amount you can afford to give, whether it's a dollar a month, three dollars, five dollars, what have you, we do appreciate that. And we should also note that uh, we do have a quiz coming up at the end of the show. Uh, Stay tuned for that. It's the uh, typical canonical couplet. We did not have one last episode, so this will be uh, kind of starting us out in a new 
series, and we will have a variety of prizes over the course of the year, including some that we're expecting from some very generous listeners. So stay tuned for that as well. Charles Prepolek, BSI, is the man with the twisted lip. He's also a master bootmaker, a former mystery bookshop owner, and currently he's a freelance editor, writer, artist, speaker, and reviewer with published contributions in a variety of books and magazines. Charles is co-editor of four Sherlock Holmes fiction anthologies with J.R. Campbell for Edge, uh, the Gaslight Grimoire, Fantastic Tales of Sherlock Holmes, Gaslight Grotesque, Nightmare Tales of Sherlock Holmes, Gaslight Arcanum, Uncanny Tales of Sherlock Holmes, and Gaslight Gothic, Strange Tales of Sherlock Holmes. You may have recalled us speaking with Charles on episode 57 of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Uh, I guess that would have been back in 2013, which would put us, so oh, I guess around season seven or so, if I'm recalling correctly. We'll have a link to that show in the show notes. And in addition, co-editor of Professor Challenger, New Worlds, Lost Places, and co-editor of Beyond Rue Morgue, Further Tales of Edgar Allan Poe's First Detective for Titan Books. At the turn of the century, he served as news editor for actor Christopher Lee's official website, and he lives in Calgary, Alberta, with his wife Kristen and their cat Karma. You can find Charles online on Twitter at Sherlock Editor. Charles, welcome back to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate it. It's nice to be back. Now, what have you been doing since we spoke to you last? <laughs> Buying books mostly, I think. Buying books, doing some Sherlockian stuff, writing bits and pieces, trying to figure out what we're going to do next book-wise as far as anthology goes, but mostly buying books. Strands, you know. Wow. Uh, I, I wish I could uh, participate in the, uh, <laughs> in the process like that. Um, well, we are here uh, as part of our Collector's Corner series, and that is primarily why we wanted to talk to you about your Sherlockian collecting um, habits. But why don't you, you bring us back, and, um, and we've already heard how you met Sherlock Holmes. Why don't you fill us in as to how you first became a collector? Was that a bug that uh, bit you sometime in your youth, or uh, was it thrust upon you in later days? I think there's a degree of the collecting bug in just about everybody from, I mean, from the moment that you're aware of numbers and sequences and arithmetic progression, and you, you start to think in terms of sets and, and runs of things. I mean, we, we, it's part of our makeup. There's no collecting gene, but we tend to think in terms of uh, those little sort of set things. And then of course, as you grow up, you're being inundated with uh, messages through media of, you know, go out, collect them all, get this, get that. Uh, you, you don't want to miss out. And so so you're pre-programmed to think in terms of, I must have them all. You don't want a broken set. What's a broken set? So, so yeah, for me, I mean, early on... Uh, as a kid, comic books, comic books were the entry line here, here, here were things that had words and pictures and every one of them had a number on them. And you start to think, okay, you know, you, you, you go, you buy this and you realize, oh, there were 23 issues before this. What am I missing? Clearly I must have those. And then from comics, it went into uh, Doc Savage paperbacks in the early seventies. This was a kickoff thing for a lot of uh, a lot of my collecting habits and my interests. So you know the Doc Savage paperbacks that were coming out from Bantam. You, again, it's that thing you pick up eleven, twelve, and then you hit a used bookstore and find number seventy two, and you realize you have a stretch to fill in. So so that I mean I was programmed early on, and then once uh, Sherlock Holmes entered my life. The trick there was, uh, oh, my Lord, here's all this material. Uh, I picked up, what was it, early on was the Bering Gould, of course, the annotated. But then one of the other earliest things I picked up was uh, DeWall's World Bibliography of Sherlock Holmes. 
And then suddenly your brain just explodes because you get a sense of the scope involved. Right. And you, you realize there are other people out there and there's tons of new material coming out and you're just overwhelmed. And then, of course, my, my, my initial response was, I want it all. I want bits of everything. Look at this. There's, there's comic books. There's magazines. There's books. There's videos. There's films. There's film stills, movie posters, original artwork, prints, everything. I mean, it's, it, it was just this huge world of opportunity for an obsessive collector. <laughs> so let me, let me ask you a question about comics, Charles. So, um, A... Do you do you still have them? And B, were you a DC or a guy or a Marvel guy or everything? Well, as, as a youngster, I think my first exposure to comic books were actually German ones. Visiting in Europe to my grandmother, there were the Asterix and Obelix comics. And those I tackled in German. But of course, as I grew up and discovered superhero comic books, um, originally I was a Marvel guy, big time, like only a Marvel guy. Um, un until Marvel became just horrifying. But um, no, I don't. I, I I went through a stage where yes, I was collecting, 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 uh, and then my teen years hit, and you know, you your focus drifts, and suddenly there's girls, and comics weren't all that important anymore. <laughs> so yeah, to fund to fund dating and just being social, I actually liquidated most of the comics I'd collected by the time I was about sixteen or so. Since then, uh, yeah, well, I've managed to accumulate another 14 long boxes that I keep in a closet upstairs. And <laughs> I make a habit of hitting the comic store on Wednesdays for new comic book day to, to this day. But now it's all, I, I, I don't touch the superhero stuff. It's more the horror and gothic or period stuff that still grabs me. But yeah, I still buy comics. Now, there must have been uh, some kind of overlap uh, in your your comic interest and your Sherlockian interest at some point. I mean, there's been a, such a wide variety of Sherlock Holmes in the comics. Um, what are some favorites for you that you might be able to uh, pull out of your head? Well, for the comics, I mean, yes, there was overlap, serious overlap. The uh, it, it was also part of why I became a Sherlockian, and my interests in Sherlock Holmes were because of the cases of Sherlock Holmes comics. That were coming out by Renegade Press in the mid '80s. They started around '85 or so, and uh, with those, uh, I'd stumbled on them because I was following an artist. There was an artist I liked, Gene Day. He'd passed away. His brothers Dan and David Day carried on. It, it had very similar art style, so I was looking for anything by those guys. And I walk into a comic store, and there's a cases of Sherlock Holmes, the first issue staring off the shelf at me, and with art by uh, Dan and David Day. Pick that up, boom. Um, that has also shifted into a different level of collecting, is that I collect the original art pages, which is a pain in the butt, because so does Jerry Margolin. And uh, Jerry's got most of them these days. But uh, every once in a while, you know, I, I pry one out of his hands, and... It works. But uh, for me, yeah, the comics, I don't think there's been anything better than the cases of Sherlock Holmes. But there's been lots of modern material, too. There was a beautiful French series, uh, Le Quatre de Baker Street, the, the Baker Street 4, which is just absolutely gorgeous stuff. Um, the Europeans have actually done a lot more art-wise uh, that's sort of more quality. They've They've pushed the envelope with Sherlock Holmes comics. And um, some of them are being translated. You'll find Dark Horse has done a number of the French, uh, I can't remember, Les Vampires, Sherlock Holmes in this, Sherlock in that, Crime Alley. Um, but there's some neat stuff out there as far as comics go, and they're still coming on a regular basis. No question. Well, you must have uh, spoken in recent years with uh, Frank Cho, who was on our episode uh, on our show? Oh gosh, I think it was episode one eighty eight last season. Um, did 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 you uh, find you had a few uh, things to chat about with him? Actually, the thing with talking to Frank is it's not so much about the comic book art, but we discovered we had a, a, a our our interests 
tend to go back to graphic artists like Franklin Booth and um, Joseph Clement Call. These were illustrators who were doing illustrative work for the pulps and uh, early magazines, including things like Collier's. And, uh, you know, we found we had an appreciation, a shared appreciation for these masters, rather than so much chatting about, you know, current or modern comic book guys. So, Charles, you mentioned Asterix and Obelix, and our American listeners uh, might not know that this is a great, wonderfully drawn, incredibly beautifully styled comic series about a Gaul and a Hun, and it goes back to, uh, you know, it's it's sort of thing you would only find in Europe. You know, it's sort of a successor of the Roman Empire, these, these uh, like Tantan, you know, they get on great adventures. But I'm curious about artists. I mean, did you, were you very fond of artists? You know, when I think of Asterix and Obelix, I think of artists like, uh, Char- is it Charles Barks, who did the Disney uh, comics, because that was a big influence on Scott Bond, who drew so many Sherlockian c- cartoons for years. Carl, Carl been, Barks. Carl, Carl Barks. Barks. Yeah, yeah, it would have been Carl Barks. Um, you know, for me, the Asterix and Obelix comics, uh, I learned to draw by imitating what I was seeing in those. That, they had that big an impact. They also probably pushed me towards uh, my university studies. I, I, I intended to teach history and had a focus on classics. Why? Because as a kid, I was so obsessed with that whole Gaulish village there as a holdout against the Romans. And and, and it kind of skewed my viewpoint. Um, art-wise, though, I mean, I've, I've never really cared for Karl Barks or Bigfoot comics as a whole or that particular style. But uh, I, I, I tended as a kid to be very obsessed with comic book realism. The artist Neil Adams was top of my list. And then I ended up becoming a huge John Byrne fan. And there, there are a number of them. So, I mean, when, going back to Frank, Frank actually embodies a lot of uh, the art styles that I really dig. Clean lines, lots of detail, and uh, no waste. Yeah, Frank's a marvelous artist. And I'm pleased he's... One of he's in our uh, association and yeah. actually doing the menus. So yeah, 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 and they're fabulous. Oh, they are. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a quick break here, and when we come back, we'll speak with Charles about how his collecting has evolved. Stay tuned. <laughs> Arthur Conan Doyle wrote twenty-two novels. The one he thought his best is an adventure story of knights and chivalry. 20-year-old Alan Edrickson travels the world, encountering bullies, con artists, thieves, a damsel in distress, and two men who become his closest friends. Together they join the White Company, archers and fighters led by the gallant Sir Nigel Loring. Will our hero win the hand of Loring's romantic daughter Maud? Will the chivalrous Prince Edward restore Peter of Castile to his Spanish throne? Published in 1891 and never out of print, The White Company is a tale of pageantry and piracy, heraldry and hope, published now in an exclusive, annotated edition with the original N.C. Wyeth illustrations in blazing color. Don't you owe it to yourself to read Conan Doyle's favorite book? Get the annotated White Company at wessexpress.com. Okay, we're back t- talking with Charles Prepolek about collecting, and in particular, uh, we, we were covering his, his visual art uh, interest, and um, this kind of dovetails with uh, where you've gone in recent years. Of course, Sidney Paget was the first illustrator for the Sherlock Holmes stories in the Strand magazine. Uh, and I know so much of what we imagine about Sherlock Holmes is associated with Sidney Padgett. Certainly the, uh, the deer stalker uh, made its debut under him and uh, was, was uh, inextricably associated with Sherlock Holmes ever since. Um, so we, why don't you tell us, Charles, what led you to an interest in the Strand magazine, original Strand magazines? Well, again, you know, as I was saying earlier, that whole thing about words and pictures in combination. And, you know, as 
30 years, I've, I've been a Sherlockian for 30 years and working on this collection for at least that long. And in the early days, finding strands locally was next to impossible. I picked up a few and I thought, oh, this is just too much work. Had about four on my shelves because you just, you don't find them in Calgary. And, and I wasn't traveling as much or doing anything else. But there was that point for, for, for 25 years or so, I think I had four or five volumes on the shelf. 2017, New York walk into the Strand bookstore, go upstairs to the rare book room, step off the elevator, turn to my right. There's a glass case that had, I think, uh, uh, an original first edition, Adventures and Memoirs, signed by, I think, Ellery Queen or something. And it was like $15,000. And you're looking at this and kind of going, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> and But next to it was The Lost World, the large paper edition of the Lost World. Now, for me, I was, uh, I'd, I'd heard of it, I'd seen descriptions of it, but I'd never actually seen the volume. So there's this one sitting there. And my something just, I don't know, tripped in my brain. And I was like, I want this. It's not 15 grand, it's 1500 bucks. It's still more than I'd ever spent on a book in my life. My wife was with me. I turned to her and I said, oh, yeah, I know. I, I love this. I would love to have that. But I know, I know, it's too much money. So I ended up rooting around through some other things, found three very nice condition strand volumes. They were 40 bucks a piece. And I'm like, okay, I've made my piece. I'm just going to pick up these strands as my consolation prize. And then my wife walked over to me and whispered in my ear and said, if you really want them, go. If you really want that lost world, just do it. But you're not getting squat for Christmas or your birthday or whatever else for the year. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm losing my mind. I'm like, yeah, but I want these three strands too. So I ended up buying the three strands, had those shipped home, bought the lost world and um, carried that home in my carry on, of course. But uh, right then and there, it, it, it just sort of something tripped. It, I, I wanted the original appearances of things and that combination of the artwork again. Yeah. You've got, you know, out of, out of 60 Sherlock Holmes stories, what is it? Everything short of essentially study in Scarlet and sign of four appeared in the strand often before book pub, obviously before book publication. And suddenly the notion occurred to me that I could get, all the Sherlock Holmes stories in their original magazine appearances for considerably less than I would say having to hunt up uh, first edition Hound of the Baskervilles. Those two volumes that contain the Hound are going to be a whole lot cheaper. Plus, plus there's nothing more beautiful than an entire bookcase full of strands. <laughs> but uh, in original bindings, I have to be clear here. I'm, I'm, I'm only interested in those original blue bindings with the street scene on the front and that gilt uh, labeling on the spine. It makes a huge difference for some reason, especially when you've got, you know, 80 of them on the shelf. But that was, that was yeah. the next thing. That was the next decision I made once I decided to collect the strand was which ones am I going to buy? You look at the Strand, and there, you know, it, it began in 1891, in January of 1891, and it ran roughly to March of 1950. And in that time, that means there was a run of 711 individual issues. So you sit there, you realize, yeah, 711 issues, that's a lot of single bits of paper that's just fallen apart over the years and and will continue to degrade and break down. But the bound volumes, they have substance and they're actually really well bound. The, the quality is excellent and they will hold up and you can find them. But then the decision is how many of those am I going to buy? And my choice was that I would buy everything that was done in Conan Doyle's lifetime, which is to say 1891, to 1930, which is 40 years of the Strand and 80 volumes. So that's what I've been doing since. That's, that's reasonable, yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm curious about, about these bound volumes. Did they appear um, around the same time? Like, like for example, when 
uh, those first six issues, because I think it's it's six issues per bound volume, if I'm not mistaken. So the first half of the year of 1891 wraps up at, at the Strand. Does, does George Nunes uh, at that point say, all right, send these out, get them bound? Or was this something that occurred sometime later on? Like when did the Strand decide to start binding these volumes together? As soon as they had a six-month run. As soon as the first six months were done, they were pounding these guys out. Right. Um, what happens with the with the bound volumes, though, is you will lose all the advertising material. It's stripped out. Um, so all you're left with is all the uh, all the good stuff, right? But but there's still enough of a sense. The other the other joy of the Strand is that you're not just collecting Sherlock Holmes or Conan Doyle. You've also got a window into this time period, and you get context, you get background, you you start to realize what was going on in the world around Conan Doyle as he's writing and publishing this material. You get a feel for his contemporaries and you start to see the influences they have on his work. And then you see the influences that Doyle has had on other writers. When you, with The Strand, it's, it's not just Conan Doyle. I'll pick up a bound volume. I'll have, say, three or four Doyle pieces possibly in one volume. But I may also have four or six uh, P.G. Woodhouse first appearance stories. Or any other variety of writers. Um, you you get articles by Winston Churchill as he's you know making his escape in South Africa. There's there's just so much context, and it's this wonderful window into time and place that I think is very there's there's nothing quite like it. I figure people a hundred years from now are going to be looking at chunks of recorded video with commercials and things, and that will be our culture. But the Strand is that kind of reflection and insight into the Victorian, Edwardian, and later periods. It's it's they're they're just amazing, and yeah, the artwork, uh, the articles. Doyle Doyle was a massive contributor in his lifetime. I think he it was something like 121 short stories, over 70 articles, um, one poem. He had nine novels serialized. Was interviewed twice. Um, there's just so much to be found in the strands. If you collect nothing else, collect the strands and you've got so much. It, you, you've got almost everything there. It's amazing. Do you also collect individual issues rather than just the bound? Are well, you, are you, what's your exclusion here? What will, okay. you, what will you not collect? Maybe that's a better question within this time period. <laughs> Um, yeah, there's, there's a difference to me about what I consider collecting, casual collecting or accumulation and active collecting. The bound strands are essentially the only thing I really actively co collect. That being said, I've ended up with 14 single issues of the strand and, um, you know, it's, but it's not just the strand. I, 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 somehow I've found myself now on my shelves. I have the American magazine, everybody's magazine, Harper's, Collier's, McClure's, the Windsor Mag, a French magazine, Je sais tout, which means I know everything. Um, all the year round, the Idler, Lippincott's, um, Paul Mall magazine, Pearson's Punch and Temple Bar. I've got examples of all of those, some bound, some, some individual there's yeah it it kind of spread but those are not the active act i'm not actively collecting them <laughs> you need you need a wh smith news agent booth for your <laughs> at some point i may become one i think but uh yeah <laughs> what's your is there any big hole in your is there any is there any holy grail that you're looking for in in that collecting you know if another you know lost world for you well, I, I, I don't think so anymore. I mean, obviously, yes, I would like a Beaton's Christmas annual. Thank you very much. But I, there's, there's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing that makes me think that I'm ever, ever going to come near one. But, uh, now just, just this past weekend there with the Paul Herbert, um, uh, auction at the end of the BSI weekend, I, I've been able to add the Collier's published first appearance of Sign in the Once a Week Library Magazine edition. So now, really, I'm looking at a point where the only thing that I will not have in a magazine appearance of any kind is uh, a study in Scarlet. And that's the only thing that is essentially 
completely out of my reach. Huh. Well, I have I have two of those. I'll send you one. Oh, good man, good man. <laughs> but no, now for me, really, right. what's so- what's left on the focus is filling in the gaps in that strand collection. Like I said, in 2017, I started out with, I think, four that I had on the shelf for ages. At this point in January 2021, I have 66 of them on my shelves. And those last 14 are, uh, they're a pain. They are not easy to come by. It's What's your resource, Ben? I mean, how, how have you, are there typical dealers that you, uh, that, that specialize in strands? Is it eBay? Is it uh, ABE books? I mean, where, what's your what's your secret sauce, Charles? Uh, there's no real secret. It's basically Abe and and uh, eBay for the most part. I will go in on a pretty much daily basis to check new listings for strands, uh, which is to say from eBay, I get the alerts. From Abe, I go in usually once a week and periodically check. There are many dealers that I have bought from repeatedly, uh, and, and that's great. But um, yeah, that's about it, where I can find them. Uh, BSI Weekend Dealer's Room, the Huckster's Table. Yes, I'll find things there. I'll go see Otto when I'm in New York. But Otto's selection of strands hasn't changed much over the years. So, But mind you, I usually end up walking out of there with a Collier's a loose issue, not a strand. But uh, And then the strand or any bookstore I visit. But like I said, in Calgary, that's just not an option. It's not happening here. So it's... Yeah, online. Are there other strand collectors with whom you compete at this time? I have no idea, to be honest. It's 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 one of those things, as collectors, you tend to be a little canny and uh, keep things close to your chest, uh, what you're looking for. It's, it's the, people tell me, oh, you should send out want lists. I never send out want lists because then I feel committed to buy when a dealer comes back at me with something they have at a price... That may be more than I really want to spend. So I, I, I prefer to look for static listings and things like that rather than have somebody come back at me and go, yes, I have that rare volume that you were looking for. Here's this extremely exorbitant price because I know you're looking for it. Well, if you'd like, I mean, uh, Bert and I could always act as your agents and we'll just take a 5% fee. I mean, it's uh, pretty simple. Everybody wants some. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> small percentage here and a small percentage there. But I have to tell you, that mentality of the, oh, yes, I will collect these 80 volumes. They will be cheaper than buying first editions. With these last four, I'm hitting the wall. It's it's crunch time. I think in, by the time I'm done... You know, I'd I'd hope to keep the average cost below a hundred bucks a pop, but uh, it's it's yeah, I think that's where it's going to end up working out. Some some of the strands I've found as cheap as like ten bucks a piece, but the other end of that scale is my yeah, I've I've, I've dropped over five hundred for a single volume just because. And the problem with collecting the strand is not the early issues that are hard to find. It's the ones in the 1920s for some reason. I've, I've my, my 66, I've got to run up to volume 53. The remaining gap is after volume 53. You can find the adventures and memoirs all over the place, but that is a reflection of how the Strand Publishing, how the publication worked, their popularity. They did better early on and then kind of sort of started crapping out into the 30s. So it goes. Yeah. And then they ceased, didn't they? Nineteen was that thirty nine that they uh, well, remembering that correctly? Or was it? Uh, it was. They finally ceased publication in March of nineteen fifty. But yeah. during during the Second World War, with paper shortages and a complete change in the style of readership, they moved to a digest size, which was the beginning of the end, I think, for the Strand. And then towards the very end, they got absorbed or their name got absorbed into a magazine called Men Only. That would have been around 19, it was after the 1950 ending of the Strand officially, but you would find Men Only magazine that also would have a little strip that says, including the Strand. And that lasted for not very much longer. Fascinating. So other than other than the strands, I mean, do you have any other big passions? You know, it sounds like over the years, through comics and other things, you've uh, oh, you've got a you know, Scott's got a men only uh, 
with Holmes on the cover. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, so what's that, that main 51 that? issue is great. What's in that that's that's connected to Sherlock Holmes? Anything? Oh, uh, there was an article in that one. I can't remember what it was. It was really minor. It's mostly about the cover, that particular issue. There wasn't really anything serious in that one. But hey, it's a hell of a cover. It's it's a very, very striking one. Uh, so what else? We'll have, we'll have a scan of that image for you, uh, for listeners, if you want to check that on the show notes for this episode. So you yes, can uh, yes. see what we're talking about. So what else? What else is, you know, it sounds like over the years, you know, comic books and things, you must have had complete runs of things like the Hardy Boys and Tom Swift. Were you interested in, in what were you reading uh, when you were younger? I hate to say it. I was actually reading way out of my age group. And uh, I, I was I was reading things like Moby Dick when I was 10. Um, the Iliad, you the Odyssey. The first, you weren't collecting the first edition of the Odyssey and... Uh, no, I wasn't collecting any of this stuff, but that's where my reading sensibility kind of went. And I was always interested in horror and some of the genre fiction materials. So that was also a big part of it. It's it's that comic book thing. When you start reading comic books, most of the writers and artists are they're influenced by other more classic sort of background material. So you find yourself reading things like, you know, you, Oh, this is amazing. And then you read Bram Stoker's Dracula, or then you end up reading Stevenson's Jekyll and Hyde. Um, These things all informed the world of comic books. So you end up going back again. And so that's really a lot of what I was reading as a kid. I mean, of course I was also reading Doc Savage, the shadow, um, I was reading, oh, God help me, the John Norman Gore books, which were really softcore porn knockoff of uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, John Carter of Mars. Uh, these are things you find when you're 12 years old and reading outside your uh, <laughs> your range generally and have very understanding parents who really don't care what you're reading as long as you're reading. Yeah. And how about, so were you into Lovecraft and Sheridan La Fanu and things like that? You know, oddly, I came to a lot of uh, the 20th century guys later. Like Lovecraft was one I don't think I really started reading heavily until probably the late 80s. It's a post-Sherlock Holmes thing for me, the Lovecraft. But the same with Le Fanu, um and and a number of others. These all came sort of as backtracking, uh, looking at contemporaries of uh, other Victorian writers that I enjoyed. So it's... It, it's kind of backwards. It's it's a weird thing. But now, of course, I also am a huge horror fan. I tend to, I, I will follow small press authors that I enjoy, authors I've worked with on our own anthologies. Uh, many of their books are coming out from small presses. And it's, it's, it's all part and parcel to this Victorian sandbox, really, of characters and literature. And it all melds. It's which is further reinforced when you look at, say, the Basil Rathbone Universal films of the 40s. The Universal at the time is doing this brilliant series of horror films, you know, all the, the classic Frankenstein, Dracula, and so forth. And somehow Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce are just sort of right on the edge of that. They're part of the Universal horrors, and it all fits together. I don't know. Yeah, well, particularly the first Rathbone Bruce picture, you know, which was very noir. It was really, uh, I think Thomas Gomez was in that one as Mead. Was, was that all? Wait a minute now. Am I thinking about, was that the voice of terror? Yeah, me, that's Thomas did, did, Gomez. Did we just lose? I Bruce? think that was the first one. Did you guys freeze? Did mm-hmm. I freeze? Well, you know, it, speaking of, uh, Universal and, and horror figures, Frankenstein, Dracula, that brings us over to Hammer. And you were once the uh, editor of the uh, the Christopher Lee uh, fan site. Tell us a little bit about that, how, how you found yourself in that position. Well, again, there's that spinoff thing of from the Sherlock Holmes interests and other horror interests, a big a Hammer Films enthusiast. When Christopher Lee's son-in-law, Juan Aneros, set up the official Christopher Lee website, fan site, fan club thing, um, Juan is a transplanted Spaniard and his grasp of English could be dodgy and he needed somebody to actually proof all the news bulletins they were posting, 
uh, and deal with that sort of thing. And I was a fan. I joined the site and the, I was fairly active. And from there, we just went on to the, hey, Charles, do you want to do this? Okay, sure. <laughs> And so you end up in a few chats with Christopher Lee. I used to do this dreadful impression of Lee that was, I've been in this business for more than 54 years. <laughs> and that's, you know, I've actually done that bit for Christopher Lee. And then I ended up meeting him in 2007 when we were in the UK. He arranged for, they, they arranged a press pass in a car and brought me out. And I was able to spend time with him on the day before his 80 something birthday. And that's, it, it, it was a whole lot of fun. It also allowed me to be one of the first people to ever know that Christopher Lee, whose character in the Star Wars reboots was going to be Count Dooku or something. And it was, it was a whole lot of fun. It was a whole lot of fun. And of course, the Sherlockian overlap, right? Uh, I'm the guy on the site who's going to tell you every connection to Sherlock Holmes and Peter Cushing and all that stuff. So, so remind our, our listeners what the connection between Christopher Lee and Sherlock Holmes is or are. Wow. There's a few. Lee's connections are quite uh, substantial. You've got him as Sir Henry Baskerville in the 1959 Hammer Hound. You've got him as Sherlock or as Mycroft Holmes in the Private Life of Sherlock Holmes. You've got him as Sherlock Holmes in uh, what was it? Sherlock Holmes and Das Halsband des Todes or Sherlock Holmes and the Deadly Necklace. And then there were those geriatric Sherlock Holmes ones, Sherlock Holmes, the golden years with uh, Patrick <laughs> McNeese as Watson. Well, they, they, that's what they marketed them as. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes, the golden years. There was uh, uh, the Victoria Falls one and the opera yeah. singer one. I love the one where B. Arthur played Irene Adler. Wasn't that yeah. great? <laughs> Sherlock Holmes and the golden girl. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was it was awfully close to that, really. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, those those connections, and there was a point even as late as I think it was around two thousand and one or so. There was talk that uh, Harry Allen Towers, who had done all those Fu Manchu films in the sixties, he did a couple of Lost World films around ninety seven, ninety eight. Uh, he was still trying to put together a new Sherlock Holmes film that would have had, I think, Malcolm McDowell as Holmes and Christopher Lee as Moriarty. That was the rumor. Nothing ever came of it, but. Uh, yeah, Lee was involved in all sorts of things. Oh, well, he was a great actor, and he he counted. You know, I remember he saluted that role that Billy Wilder gave him as Mycroft as the event that really jump-started his career and proved to people that he could do more than what he'd been asked to do uh, up until that point in his career. He was very fond of that role, as I remember. He he was indeed. He he considered it a huge breakout, as you pointed out. That uh, rather than playing Dracula for the millionth time, he he was allowed to do something else. Of course, Lee also will tell you repeatedly in different interviews that he had to shave his head for that one, which is <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had to shave my head so my toupee would fit. Oh, what a giveaway. That's 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 the thing. It's always hilarious. And you still you encounter fans who are like, oh no, he 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 obviously uh you know he had to shave his head for that. Yeah, in one interview he said he had to wear a bald cap. In another interview he said he shaved his head. Basically, he just got out of bed and didn't put on the tube that day. So yeah. it's yeah. Make of that what you will. Oh, uh, that's great. <laughs> now, of course, he also uh, hosted, I think it was 1984, 85, uh, The Many Faces of Sherlock Holmes, which is, um, I, I remember seeing that when I first got my start um, and, and really getting a broad um, understanding of, of the figure in, you know, well, it was mostly in film. Uh, that, that's what that documentary was covering is how uh, Sherlock Holmes appeared in film over those many years. So. Uh, and he was uh, he was a great host. I remember he was uh, for for part of the filming. He was seated in the sitting room in uh, the re the recreation of the sitting room in the Sherlock Holmes pub uh, yeah, those upstairs. Were, so those were um, fun. that was all just a promotional yeah. piece, I think, tied in for the release of young Sherlock Holmes in 85, because I think that's where they ended it. All right. But uh, yeah, no, he, he, he was also he did. A, he had an appearance in a Conan Doyle adaptation that was done of uh, the leather funnel. All right. So there's a yet another connection. 
Uh, Jane Seymour was in that with him, and Simon Ward was in that with him. It was done for television somewhere. I can't even remember the date now. I think around seventy eight or nineteen eighty. But it was uh, it was it was neat. The many faces of Christopher Lee rather than the many faces of Sherlock Holmes. Exactly. So, Charles, when you step back, when when you finally achieve your dream of uh, acquiring all eighty volumes of the Strand. Um, it's kind of like when a dog catches a car. Well, now what are you going to do? What's next? (laughs) Well, that's one thing. I mean, you set yourself this goal because it's achievable and it's, it's finite. And that was the big difference for me. That was the big change rather than, you know, when I, early on, I was collecting film stills. I was collecting pastiches. I have, I've got a seven foot by four foot bookcase of just all hardcover pastiche. And even that seemed attainable back in the eighties when I first started doing this. But now with self publishing, MX publishing, everything else, you, there's, it's impossible to actually have a finite collection of pastiche. So gave all that up. And uh, what will I do when I finish my strands? Uh, I, I also have interest in a whole lot of other authors, to be honest. And uh, I'd like to focus more on some of them. I mean, I do like my John Buchan. I like my Rudyard Kipling. I like Jules Verne. I like H.G. Wells. I like a whole bunch of guys who are way more expensive than I can generally afford. And I look forward to figuring out a way to collect some of their stuff. <laughs> So, I mean, there's always room and I will always continue to pick up new things. I mean, you know, the new BSI press publications I continue with um, everything else. But do do I feel I still need to have that uh, holy grail kind of collecting? Nah, I think I'll be all right. That is um, it will be a remarkable collection once it is done. Uh, something uh, to be seen, particularly with all those blue bindings uh, because there are variants you know there are brown and red and and others but i think your commitment to uh this consistency will make it a very very attractive collection when it's all said and done so well uh charles prepolek you can find him on twitter at uh, sherlock editor uh it's been a pleasure having you with us here again charles uh don't be such a stranger uh, you know let's not make it 150 uh, episodes before we speak to you next time you guys want me i'm here it's a real pleasure to be able to chat with you guys again this is a whole lot of fun and to talk about collecting i mean come on that's just yeah that's that's the blood <laughs> yeah. all right charles thanks so much thank you What a great interview with Charles. You know, it's amazing the variety of the people that we talk to and the different attitudes and outlooks on things like collecting. He's got, but Charles is, he's got just a great spirit and it just comes through in talking to him about it. And he's got so much knowledge and so much taste and so much interest and curiosity and things. And he's so eloquent, you know? I mean, and he's also interested in things like H.G. Wells and Kipling and Jules Verne and the comics. Um, you know, he's really sort of a Renaissance collector. It's, uh, it's great. It's great fun to talk to him. And I had no idea that, um, you know, he was in sight of, ha- of course, it's going to take a while, but in sight of having a full collection of strands, that's, uh, that's amazing. I know. And, you know, if anything, I think Charles's narrative uh, makes it clear how uh, serious collectors are are not going about this willy nilly. Uh, they have a particular goal. They have um, specific uh, attributes that they have mapped out. They know it is. They know what it is that they're not looking for, just as much as they know what it is they are looking for. And I think, to the degree as a collector, that you can, you know, put those guardrails up. And give yourself some kind of reasonable goal to achieve. Uh, that's really what makes it fun. Because as, as Charles said, when he was collecting comics, you know, well, or, or pastiches, that's a never ending <laughs> uh, journey. And, and that's not satisfying. You know, you just feel like, oh, God, I've, I have to buy this now. 
just because it came out, right? Versus the collector who really wants something, who has that that white whale that they're looking for to fill those gaps. Um, and then when you're done with it, you, you say, okay, mission accomplished. Now let's move on to the next project. And you give yourself another assignment. Yeah, interesting. Well, uh, I think we got to the point here where we need you to check out a word from our sponsor. Uh, we will bring you a word from MX Publishing. They have a program now called Books to Books. You heard of their Books to Trees program where they would plant a tree for every book that's purchased. Well, now uh, with Books to Books, they are actually funding not only the Thousand Trees, but they're turning it into donations to the Happy Life Schools in Kenya where they are helping kids to read. With the expansion of Happy Life Schools, MX tells us that the team are providing education not just for the 150 kids at Happy Life, but hundreds more in the local communities. In the Books to Books project, they want to fund 1,000 school books by the end of 2021. So every $50 that you spend on the MX Publishing website will go towards a $5 donation, the average cost of a school book, to Happy Life. So when you get to enjoy the fine books from MX Publishing, and believe me, there are quite a few to choose from. The kids at the Happy Life Village in Kenya will also benefit from what it is that you're enjoying. So thank you to MX Publishing for expanding reading beyond our borders and beyond the usual and helping kids to become literate. And now, back to our show. Well, of course you recognize that music. It is January, and that means, once again, it's time to resume our quiz program. Yes, that's right. It's Canonical Couplets, the time when we give you two lines of poetry about a a Sherlock Holmes story, and you identify which story it was. Now, remember, the last time we were here, we didn't have a canonical couplet, so we don't have any winners to announce this time. Um, but we are launching now. This is, uh, as we mentioned, this is season 15 of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. We're going to do something a little different this year. Uh, we're going to do some canonical couplets, and then we'll bring a surprise quiz program on uh, perhaps every other week. You'll have to stay tuned to see how we roll this out. But we've got some ideas. Uh, If anything, people around here can't accuse us of not having ideas. So, uh, Bert, are you ready for the first canonical couplet of season 15? I'm ready. Okay. Um, Make sure you jot this down because I'm coming back to you next week to see uh, how well you do. You arouse my curiosity, Watson said at the enigmatic message which left an old man dead. If you know the answer to this canonical couplet, put it in an email addressed to comment at iheroofsherlock.com with canonical couplet in the subject line. If you are among all the correct answers and we choose your answer at random, you will win a prize. Good luck. Oh, and you know, Bert, I didn't mention it, but we, we do have a named prize this time around. Oh, excellent. Yeah, it is a DVD, a documentary. We mentioned it while we were speaking with Charles. The Many Faces of Sherlock Holmes, hosted by Christopher Lee. It is uh, unopened. So uh, this will be a first viewing for whomever wins the prize. So we hope uh, lots of people are listening, and uh, we hope everybody sends in the correct answer. Excellent. Well, well, this is uh, this is exciting stuff. Uh, another show under our belt as we uh, get 2015, excuse me, 2015, <laughs> season 15 going in 2021. Uh, lots more lined up for this year. We have lots of great guests that we're going to be talking to. Uh, who will be next? Well, you'll have to stay tuned. Uh, in the meantime, I am Scott Monty. And I'm Bert Wolder. And reminding you to... Make sure you tune into the show on whatever podcast catcher you use and give us a rating, a review. We say the the games games of our foot. foot.
<laughs> the, the game's, game's afoot. afoot. You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I'm neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs>